Ole Miss releases an updated depth chart last night. We're going to go through it and see what all you need to know and talk about it here. And also, what are we looking for? What do we want to see against Troy? Find out next on the Locked On Ole Miss podcast. You are Locked On Ole Miss, your daily podcast on the Ole Miss Rebels, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. All right, welcome to the Locked On Ole Miss podcast. I'm your host, Stephen Willis. Thank you very much for joining us. Today's been a really weird day. I'll explain about that in just a second. But first of all, I do want to tell you thank you for making the Locked On Ole Miss podcast your first listen every day. We're free and available wherever you get your podcast, including YouTube. So do us a favor. Subscribe to the YouTube channel. Hit the bell for notifications. For It's a lot of videos coming out, but hit the bell for notifications and also upload video itself. I would appreciate that. A new depth chart was released from Ole Miss football tonight. We recorded this first segment a little bit earlier with the previous depth chart that we had and went through it. They released a new one, so we're going to do a new segment here um, to make sure everything matches up. This is the offensive side of the ball. Um, they're Jonathan Mingo and then Dennis Jackson or Dayton Wade. We did a video last week about how we said Dayton Wade was going to play. There you go. He's on the list. Malik Heath or Jordan Watkins or Jalen Knox on the other side. There's a lot more ors on this depth chart, if you'll notice. Jalen Robinson or J.J. Henry. Mason Brooks at right tackle, still starting. Eli Actor at right guard. Um, Cale Bourne in center, broker at left guard, Jeremy James at left tackle. That is unchanged from the depth chart that was released this morning. Um, Casey Kelly or Michael Trigg starting, Luke Altmeyer or Jackson Dart. That goes without saying. We knew that they would not name a starter, but they would not release that because John Sumrall, honestly, doesn't need to know that information, although we assume it's going to be Jackson Dart. Um, Zach Evans is the you know the starter, and then you have Ulysses Bentley the fourth, and then Quinshawn Judkins. Um, Judkins made it on. They took Kincaid Dent off. Um, he'll make an appearance a little bit later, but they did take him off of there. But that is what the offensive depth chart looks like. Honestly, it doesn't look a whole lot different, mu- much more different than the one that was released this morning. But there are one or two changes. Um, from what they released this morning. I don't know if this morning is more accurate than tonight. This is the benefit of a media day depth chart. You you don't know which one. Maybe the earlier one, the one that we um, did this morning, was actually more accurate, but we're going to see what this goes. If you look at the defensive side of the ball, you got Cedric Johnson and then Damon Clowney or Brandon Mack. J.J. Bakis is now at the three technique and he's not backing him up at nose guard. This morning he was backing up at nose guard. Um, he was a starter over Jamon Gordon and Taiwan, or Taiwan Malone. Katie Hill is um, over Isaiah Iton. Uh, it's an or situation. I don't, you know, take it for what it's worth. Then at defensive end, you have Tavius Robinson or Jared Ivey. I really like Jared Ivey, um, and that's not just because his mom watches the show. Um, linebacker, Austin Keys or Kari Coleman. And, or Troy Brown or Ashanti Seastrunk. So kind of a etched in sand room for the linebackers. And then you have DeAndre Prince as an un, yeah, definite starter. He's being backed up by Markevious Brown. Ashim Young at um, strong safety. That's the same things this morning. Um, A.J. Finley is still there um, being backed up by Deshaun Jerkins. Um, Otis Reese. This is the position thing that I said, hey, Pay attention. I think something's missing here, and it was MJ Daniels was the player that was missing below um, Otis Reese. So they have it listed as D, uh, DB instead of a bandit and star and, and craziness. Um, Tashim Johnson over um, Ladarius Tennyson. That's an or situation. There's a lot, Like I said, there's a lot of ors on this depth chart, on these depth charts. And the last one is Miles Battle or Davidson Igmanusen, Igbonison. Um, I don't know about the pronunciation. Forgive me if I got it wrong. 
If we look at the specialists, this is where the biggest change probably was. Jonathan Cruz listed the starting kickoff guy and field goal kicker. Um, new backup, by the way, a high school kicker, Christian Shannonfelt. Um, Frazier Mason is the projected starting punter. Um, junior high school, interesting. Um, Charlie Pollock, um, freshman transfer. That's the supposed frat house um, punter. Um, Kincaid Dent is the starting holder, backed up by Luke Altmeyer. Kick return and punt returns the same. Jalen Robinson, but it's an or situation now. It's Jalen Robinson or Dennis Jackson or Dayton Wade. Punt returns is Jalen Robinson or J.J. Henry or Jordan Watkins. I mean, it's it's nothing too too crazy to think of. You know, it's just the way it kind of works out. And I think this will be a good setup for the Ole Miss football team. I kind of look forward to the way they go. Do. Now, when you look at depth charts, was this morning more accurate than this afternoon's? I don't know. We're not going to know until Saturday, period. Whenever they go out there and play, the first one could have been taken down because it gave away too much, and they wanted to give away even less, and they put oars all over the second depth chart. Or there were some factual mistakes in the first one, and they needed to correct them, and they noticed them and had to build a new depth chart throughout the day. So the second one is correct. We do not know. So we do not know why it was taken down originally. We do not know why it was um, put up again. It could, like I said, it could have been good, too good. It could have been too bad. Either way, it could have been taken down and then somewhere in the middle gets put in up. Put up. That is, that's just the nature of things. Like Steve Sarkeesian is not doing a depth chart. No depth chart throughout the whole season. He's not going to put it up. He's not going to deal with it. And... It's like, okay, you know, if you're, if you're not going to do it, don't do it, but okay. So it is what it is. And honestly, I'm looking forward to a different type of Ole Miss whenever we watch them play. The Matt Corral Ole Miss, everybody liked the Matt Corral Ole Miss. That's fine. That's acceptable. But I want to see what the Jackson Dart looks like. The Luke Altmeyer, whichever one, the or goes out. Again, I will re reiterate, I have not read, seen, or heard any single thing that said Luke Altmeyer has won this job. I'm not going to BS you. Uh, I, it, it, if there was a competition there, I would absolutely say that. But I have not heard that anywhere. And when we do this Twitter space tonight, I'm sure we're going to have two or three questions about it. It's not a favorite thing or a rooting thing. You're, you're rooting against Luke Altmaier. No, I, I could care less. If Luke Altmaier was the guy, he would be the one that we're putting up as the guy. It's a prediction thing. That's, that's all it is. It's not a favoritism thing. It's not a ride or die thing. Whichever quarterback is the quarterback will be the quarterback, and he'll be my quarterback. But I get paid for takes. I get paid to have an opinion on things like this. So I'm going to. And that's the reason I've taken basically Jackson Dart. I, everywhere I see, everywhere I read, every piece of information about it is all pointing one way. I can't ignore that as much as I want to. I mean, I think, Somebody in the comments for the press conference video was like, hey, you're always, all of you media people are saying high ceiling when it comes to Jackson Dart. And explain yourself. And I, and I tried to put it down. This is what we mean. This is why we think that. And it's because of his height, his arm talent, his weight, his prototypical size to be a dual threat quarterback. He's like a bigger built Matt Corral. His ceiling, he threw for, in high school, 6,000 yards and ran for another 1,000. He has two 300-yard games under his belt. His ceiling is through the roof. And, him, and saying that his ceiling is through the roof is not a slight on Luke Altmeyer. You only th would think it would be a slight if you're rooting. But that is a factual situation. There is more 
there. You have a larger sample size with him than Luke. Now, does that mean Luke is bad? No, not even a little bit. In fact, as much as Luke Altmyer has competed and, and done everything necessary for this competition, that kid should be celebrated. He has worked. He has done the things he needs to do, and he's handled this right. And the winner of this quarterback competition, Ole Miss will be better for it because Luke Altmyer didn't just give up whenever this transfer came in. He chose to fight. He chose to compete. And Ole Miss is going to be better for it. That isn't a root situation. That's a fact situation. So, again, do not root for a quarterback to be the starting quarterback. Root for the logo on the side of the helmet. A prediction is different than rooting. You're going to have predictions without actually rooting for a kid. But some people are rooting. I get that. I went through John Rice Plumley and Matt Corral. I've seen what can happen and how it can fracture a fan base. I'm trying to avoid that. Trying to avoid that. Bet online is the fastest and easiest way to check in on all of your betting needs. Find all of your favorite sports and events at the number one online source for odds, lines, and games. Find reviews and news of every league, including Major League Baseball, NFL, NBA, NHL, combat sports, esports, and even golf. I bet you say pretty please. They'll even throw in an MLS line or two. Bet online continues to be the top online resource for all of your sports wagering information from live in-game betting. Scores and podcasts, they have you covered. Um, Ole Miss is a, I think, a 21.5-point favorite over Troy this weekend. Head to Bet Online today or use your mobile device to learn more about the action happening today. Bet Online, where the game starts. All right, thank you for making the Locked On Ole Miss podcast your first listen every day. We are free and available wherever you get your podcast, including iTunes and Spotify. Leave a five-star review for us there. You can say whatever you want to say. Just make sure it's a five-star review that will help people find it in the future. Um, but thank you very much for tuning in. All right, so what do we want to see against Troy? What is that goal? What is that end game that we are all looking forward to? And looking against Troy, what I really want to see is a competent offense. And by competent, I don't mean I'm expecting 550 yards or 600 yards or something like that. No. I'm expecting a team that will operate fairly well. They want, they need to have procedure penalties, keep them at a minimum. Holdings, keep them at a minimum. Line up quickly. Play with tempo. Do all the operational stuff that they were supposed to settle with the mock game in the mock game. That is one of the things that I am really looking at to see. I want to see that. On defense, I want to see a true two deep, honestly. You've heard all year from me and elsewhere how deep this team looks. Now, is this team really deep or is this like whenever we're talking and telling a story about a basketball team and we inevitably say, oh, this team's 11 men deep across the bench and Ole Miss ends up at the end of the year playing seven guys. Is that the situation? Are we supposed to call them deep? That's, that's an interesting thought process for me. But I want to see both le le levels and lines. I want to see linebackers play really well. Troy Brown looks to be the alpha in their linebacker room. Um, but then you have Austin Keys and Kari Coleman that there's an or on the depth chart by their name. So I'm expecting both of them to do fairly well. And then you've got the defensive backs, where they're going to line up, how they're going to use them. I I am just really interested to see how this defensive backfield is going to line up and play. Especially whenever DeAndre Prince is like 6'1 or 6'2 and he's two inches shorter than the other corner. There's some length that Ole Miss has on the defensive side of the ball out wide that's pretty impressive. But then you have super athletes like Davidson and Bonison, um, Tyshim Johnson, you got super physical guys like Aishim Young, Ladarius Tennyson, Otis Reese. This has a chance to be a defensive backfield that is fairly dominant. Now, I have said for six months, to the point where I have reviews, that this has actually pissed y'all off whenever I say it, and I say it over and over again. And the reason I say that is because it's true. Because it's one thing to be talented, and it is un. Undoubtedly, 
this team is talented. It is quite another to be good. They need to fulfill the promise of their talent. And part of that was built in camp, and part of that is going to be built as this moves forward. Should be really interesting, honestly. I'm looking forward to how it looks. I'm looking forward to a bunch of stuff. But it should be interesting for the Ole Miss defense coming up against Troy, and they have depth that we have not seen in a while. They have more depth per what we hear than any defense I can remember, even the 20, um, 1992 defense. Those guys, um, Dwayne Dotson, Abdul Jackson, Cassius Beware, Tim Bowens, Norman Hand, um, I think Alundis Bryce might have been on that team. Some good players, some excellent front, run, front line players. I don't know if the depth was quite there like this one. So we'll see exactly what this looks like because Troy – from what Josh Boutwell said yesterday, Troy's going to line up and try and play Brett Bielema Arkansas ball, potentially. They could line up and play an extreme version of what Kentucky did last year. I'm really interested in what this is going to look like because they've been an air raid team, as he's talked about. They've been an air raid team ever since Larry Blakeney. They've been throwing the ball around, doing whatever. Now they want to be a pop-you-in-the-mouth physical team. So it's going to be important for Ole Miss to play well early. Because it's important against a team that does this to jump on them a little bit. Make them play catch up. Get them out of their game plan. Because if they can line up in 22 personnel and run the ball downhill consistently, that's a little bit of a problem for Ole Miss. This is a game that I think that it is possible that Ole Miss might not cover the 21 and a half points. Now, Ole Miss might win by 14, 17 points, and it's relatively comfortable all the way throughout. But if Ole Miss gets off to a slow start, or let's say it looks like the 2015 Memphis game to where Ole Miss scores two touchdowns really quick off of big plays, that'll allow Troy, if they can get something going offensively, to eat a ton of um, time. I expect Troy to snap the ball between 10 – seven seconds on the play clock. And, I mean, this could all be wrong, but this is all going off of that Josh Boutwell conversation that you heard yesterday. If that happens, this is what our game might look like. So I want to see Ole Miss really take control of this game and not let Troy get into that to where they have 30, 35 minutes of time of possession. I want to get into a situation where Ole Miss is comfortable in the game. I don't mind if Ole Miss is uncomfortable in the first and second quarter, but once we get to the third quarter, this needs to be comfortable. Now, it's the first game, and uh, at the end of the day, it doesn't mean anything. The year that Ole Miss went 7-1 and one in the SEC and lost to LSU that year, um, and LSU ended up winning the national championship, but they went 7-1 and one in the SEC, it required a 52-yard field goal by Jonathan Nichols to beat Vanderbilt that season. Game ones can be tricky. We're going to overreact to them. Sure, that's what we do. But understand this. Whenever we're overreacting to them, it is a first game. And if Ole Miss survives the first game, you get Central Arkansas. And then you ramp up and get Georgia Tech. And then you ramp up and get Tulsa. And then the big boy games start. It's going to be all right. It's going to be a lot of fun. And I'm looking forward to all of it. So anyway, after the break, um, John Garcia is going to come by and talk running backs. John Garcia on running backs. Should be pretty cool. We'll see you then. All right, thanks again for making the Locked on Ole Miss podcast your first listen every day. We are free and available wherever you get your podcast, including iTunes and Spotify. You can say whatever you want to say. Just make sure it's a five-star review. Anyway, I'd like to thank the LinkedIn Jobs site for being the official college football recruiting sponsor across Locked on College Network. LinkedIn helps you find the candidates you want to talk to faster. Post your job for free at linkedin.com slash locked on college. Terms and conditions apply. They, of course, sponsored John Garcia. He came in and talked about quarterbacks, including quarterbacks that are on the roster. 
We're going to do the same thing today, maybe with running backs. And one of the players that really has my interest peaked is Quinshawn Judkins. What can you tell the Ole Miss fan base about Quinshawn? Quinshawn, Stephen, is your your conventional SEC back. I think if you if you want a throwback player on the roster, and, and look, you know, Snoop Connor was kind of that for Ole Miss for, for, for quite a while. You want that type of back in, in this recent recruiting classes and, and the freshman Judkins brings that to the table. He is a low center of gravity, physical player uh, who seems to just get better as the game wears on. I, I was at his last game in high school, the state championship game last December, uh, and it was his show. I mean, he was a 25 carry, 200 yard kind of back uh, against a really good Pleasant Grove team that was built to stack the box and stop him. But four yards became six yards, six yards became 10 by the time the second half rolled around because Judkins brings the lumber at, at 215 pounds or so. But I think he's more than just that. Certainly the the strength, the, the low center of gravity, the low plane and the downhill style is his bread and butter. But he's also got this element of space that he brings to, to the game, whether it's in the passing game as a blocker or as a receiver where you actually see him make a whole lot of moves in the open field. His hands are soft. He can put together some of the traditional running back routes that you're going to ask of, of a player of that caliber, your outcut, your swing pass, your arrow route, your choice route, things like that. And he could finish thereafter. And, and again, once he gets into that realm, he's even more successful because now you're talking about back seven defenders trying to wrap up a, a really physically impressive player who again really runs well behind his pads so not a whole lot of dancing or or sauce in the open field but he can stick his foot in the ground and make make the first defender miss and then run with physicality and finish forward thereafter so there's a lot to like about the floor of Quinshawn Judkins whether you want him to be that classic workhorse or in the modern game to be that change of pace where most backs are a little bit more three down prone. So you bring in a bigger back to change the pace opposite of, of how you used to do it uh, 10, 15 years ago. So I think in either role, Judkins can have an impact pretty early on at Ole Miss, even with how stacked this running back room appears to be. Yeah, and uh, you know how much I love doing comps, but whenever I watch his high school film and everything, the player that stood out to me was TJ Yeldon. He very good lateral quickness. I saw a lot of TJ in his game. Yeah, and built similarly, right? Both mm -hmm. guys are, are taller backs, six foot, six one, and thicker. You know, not they, they play lighter than they look, uh, but they could also lower that pad level uh, when the time comes. So I like that comp, especially from a, a physical standpoint. I think TJ was a little bit more smooth and graceful with it, but that came with time. You know, I think at, in high school at Daphne High School, both guys from the state of Alabama uh, as well. In high school, TJ was a little bit more ferocious, a little bit more physical because uh, he couldn't run away from or he could run away from the from defenders. So he just kind of doubled down on, on being that physical presence. And then he became a little bit more balanced at Alabama and, and, of course, in the NFL thereafter. But, yeah, I like the comp from a physical perspective. And I do think Judkins has that type of receiving upside as his game continues to progress. Uh, and I think he fits the modern game in, in that sense. So, yeah, that's a, that's a good comp. I'm not fighting that one at all. All right. That's awesome. Uh, okay, let's move on to the class of 2023. Um, Ole Miss was in for Dante Dowdle, and he ended up going to Oregon. You know, reasons, who knows what happens. But is there any player that Ole Miss is kind of into right now at the running back position for 2023? We're hearing a whole lot about Ole Miss and Chris Johnson, the running back out of Dillard High School in South Florida. Fort Lauderdale is, is the city there in Broward County. And this has really become a two-horse race. It's Ole Miss and it's the local program, Miami, that are really kind of jockeying back and forth for positioning here. But let me tell you, don't, don't fall in love with the geography in this one. Chris really feels like, and we visited with him this week, really feels open. Uh, he's, he hasn't frequented Miami as you would expect a kid uh, who's who's relatively close to campus, about 25, 30 miles or so. Uh, he's really taking a, a slower approach to the process and and really he feels like they're contrasting styles with lane kiffin and how open it is at old miss versus how miami wants to be kind of traditional and establish that line of scrimmage and i think when you talk about his game stylistically you could see why old miss is a primary contender here because he fits that role that hybrid role so well kind of the opposite 
of a Quinshawn Judkins, a guy who's incredibly fast, lighter, leaner, uh, built for the space game, so much so to the point where he was playing wide receiver at Dillard High School earlier in his varsity career. So truly a a 50-50 hybrid where you can line him up in the slot just as much as you line him up in the backfield offsetting uh, your quarterback in the shotgun. So a player who is certainly built for all of the speed and space elements of the modern game that you ask for. But he's not short either. He's about 5'11". He looks like he could carry another 10 to 15 pounds. So he could probably build out and become a more balanced back. But again, uh, unbelievable speed, track uh, numbers to verify that. I think he's 10'5 or so in the 100-meter dash. So legitimate wheels and experience as a wide receiver. That's got to make it so interesting when you talk about making that position projection and how he fits at a school like Ole Miss versus Miami. So I think it's going to be fascinating down the stretch. Um, the styles are different. Uh, the locales are so different. I think it'll take official visits to each program and then probably come to a decision before his senior season wraps up. And, and again, this is a kid who's really curious about the on-field product as well. You know, he admitted, and it got a little bit of pushback on social media when we put the story out. He said, hey, I want to see what Miami looks like. This is a new staff, a new group in town. I want to see what their offense looks like. I already know what I'm getting if I pick Ole Miss. I know the type of offense and what is going to be asked of me. So I think from a fit perspective, he's leaning towards the Rebels at this moment. But how long does he allow that Miami impression to begin to close that gap in in what looks like it could be a coin flip type of recruitment? And before we get out of here, I just want to ask you this question. In, in, in year three of the Lane Kiffin era, what is the perception of his high school recruiting to everyone? I think it's it's kind of up and down. I, I think everybody knows, particularly with an offensive recruit, that if Lane Kiffin really wants you and he's prioritizing you, it's, it's going to be hard to, to win because of the not only the uh, tangible from what we've seen from Lane Kiffin offenses, not, not even just at Ole Miss, but even – before that point, uh, but also just kind of the laid back and, and different approach personality wise that he brings relative to the Mario Cristobal's and some more old school type coaches that are a little bit more, you know, black and white with either you're in or you're out uh, type of type of uh, intensity, if you will. So I do think it's interesting uh, for, for recruits to kind of inherit and take in what Lane is, is selling. And I think elsewhere, there's this sense that Lane is going to focus on his guys And then just, you know, he knows the portal is there. He knows there's always going to be opportunity to add talent in other directions. So in in that way, it kind of goes, uh, it kind of splits because you either say, well, well, if I am being prioritized by Lane as a high schooler, it means he really wants me. Or two, it's like, well, you know, I can be a little bit more casual with Ole Miss. Maybe some spots will be available longer term because the class won't be at 20 prospects anytime soon. So there's a little bit more patience, I think, viewed in receiving that Ole Miss scholarship offer. And that's why a lot of the, the big names we're talking about, Chris Johnson, Braxton Myers, maybe Caden Lee, the receiver, there's really no rush from any of them seemingly to make that final call. Yeah, and we're going to talk about Caden Lee next week, so that's a little teaser for everybody. Beautiful. Um, but anyway, John, thank you for stopping by today. Um, of course, get more on the SEC by making Locked On SEC your second listen every day. Host Chris Gordy and his local experts, of Locked On. Take you across the SEC in 30 minutes. Make Locked On SEC your second listen. John, thank you very much for coming by. And like I said, I'll talk to you again next week, bud. Sounds good, Stephen. Take care. All right, man.